some of you dinner. Does anybody go to Izzy's Buffet anymore? I don't think they do. That used to be the thing. Well, come on back together. I love this chapter. It's very relevant for what's going on on the earth today. Jesus gives us some really cool examples of how to walk out life. Okay, you guys ready for chapter 7 of John? Okay, I'm going to try to get through the whole chapter this, this morning. And there's three things that I want you to watch for when we jump in. And you can be looking and thinking about this as we're reading through it. Theme number one. The, time, the timing of heaven on your life and your obedience to do the will of the Father and how much more important that is than your ability, your anointing, or your, um, even your ability to draw a crowd. Okay? Jesus shows us this in this chapter. So the timing of heaven and your obedience to do the will of the Father, it's more important than your ability, your anointing, and Jesus is going to show us. Thing number two. There's a lot of controversy and disagreement in this chapter about who Jesus is. Where Jesus came from. And that's, that controversy hasn't stopped, has it? Thing number three. Jesus is not confused at any time. He knows who he is. He knows who sent him. He knows where he came from and he knows where he's going. His mission would not be deterred by needs. His mission would not be deterred by wants or the approval of men and women. And the thing that you're going to see in this chapter this morning is that when your mission is to glorify the Father, you'll stay in the timing and protection of heaven. And we can learn a lot from this, okay? So those are the things I want you to watch for. Last week, we left off with a really powerful interaction between Peter and Jesus. That's, that's where things left off. And Jesus was asking Peter, just based on so many people being offended by him, he was saying, you know, unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you have no part of me. And people wigged out about it. You know, I understand. That's a little, it's a little harsh to say. But Jesus wasn't afraid of telling it like it is and even drawing lines. And I think sometimes we are. But um, Jesus, you know, he had, he had made a pretty clear statement. And many people abandoned him because of it. And so he looks to his disciples and he says, will you go too? And Peter who I feel a lot like Peter sometimes, says, I don't get what you just said. But where else would I go? Amen. Only you have the words of life. And he experienced what it meant to like really be living in who you were created for by walking with Jesus. And even though I don't even think in this moment Peter had a full realization of who Jesus was, like, they were still wondering a little bit themselves, is he the Messiah? But he knew his life had been forever affected by it, and only Jesus had the words of life. And so that was a really powerful interaction, right? I feel like I can relate to that a little bit. So here we go. This morning we're going to jump into chapter 7, and let's start in verses 1 through 11. Um, I'm just going to read it to you. I'm in the Passion Translation. I really like it. There's some controversy over it. I don't care. If you're offended by it, that's okay. 
Get over it. I'm not asking you to eat my flesh or drink my blood. Just listen to this really great translation. So, chapter 7, verse 1. After Jesus traveled extensively throughout the province of Galilee, after this, I'm sorry, Jesus traveled extensively throughout the province of Galilee, and he avoided the providence of Judea, for he knew the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem were plotting to have him killed. And now the annual Feast of Tabernacles was approaching, so Jesus' brothers came to advise him. Now these are his half-brothers. They have the same mom. They don't really share any DNA. Vibes. Because Jesus is divine, right? And, but these are his half-brothers. They have the same mama, different daddies. They have this great advice for him. And they say, Jesus, why don't you leave the countryside villages and go to Judea where the crowds are? So that your followers can see your miracles. Because no one can see what you're doing here in the backwoods of Galilee. How do you expect to be successful and famous if you do all these things in secret? Now is your time to go to Jerusalem. Come out of hiding. Show the world who you are. And his brothers were pushing him, even though they didn't believe in him as the Savior. Jesus responded, My time of being unveiled hasn't yet come. But any time is a suitable opportunity for you to gain man's approval. The world can't hate you, but it does me, for I'm exposing their evil deeds. You can go ahead and celebrate the feast without me. My appointed time has not yet come. Jesus lingered in Galilee until his brothers had left for the feast in Jerusalem. And then later, Jesus took back roads and went into Jerusalem in secret. During the feast, the Jewish leaders kept looking for Jesus and asking around, Where is he? Have you seen him? See, they had an agenda. So Jesus knows that he's making a big stir among the religious people. He's making a big stir everywhere, but particularly, he's making the kind of stir that gets you death threats from religious people. And he was spending time in Galilee, away from Jer Jerusalem, to avoid the angry mobs. And he was not interested in taking his brother's advice because he knew the timing of the Lord. He says, it's not yet my time. If he had done what his brothers had suggested, it may have sped up the process. And it was not yet his time to go to the cross. Because he knew that there was hatred, anger, jealousy, murder in the hearts of the Pharisees. And they were plotting and making arguments against him according to their Jewish laws. He was healing people on the Sabbath. And it's a no-no, apparently, to heal people on the Sabbath. It's better to just let them be sick, stay in their, in their bondage, you know. So, I'm a little intrigued at the brothers. I don't know if you guys were when you read that. What's their motivation? I don't think they were trying to set him up. I think they were trying to ride his celebrity. And Jesus is so wise, and he shows us the importance of doing the Father's will, and walking in the timing of the Lord, and in the timing of heaven on your life. You see, the brothers wanted to ride his coattails to notoriety, and they didn't even really believe in who he was. They just saw the signs and wonders. They didn't really believe he was the Messiah. They didn't know his mission. They didn't believe his mission. And so they couldn't celebrate with him and, and walk with him in integrity and, and care about the mission and the timing of God on his life. They cared about the crowd. They cared about being associated with like a happening thing. Have you ever seen that happen before? Maybe you've even felt it. There's a lot of gifted people in the room. And maybe you felt the push of people. Hey, maybe you've wondered even at times why I feel hidden. Like I've got a lot of anointing and juice on my life, you know? Why am I in hiddenness? <laughs> it's the timing and care and protection of the Lord. And Jesus, he's, he's showing us this really subtly in these scriptures. 
You don't want to go outside of heaven's timing. It doesn't matter how big a crowd there is. It doesn't even matter how many people need a miracle. You have to be obedient to the will of the Father. So they're urging him to go to a bigger city where they could be in the spotlight with him. And to say, come out of hiding now. Let the world see who you are. You're so anointed. So gifted. The world should know about you. Have you ever heard that? I know Angela has. Everyone needs to hear your songs. Do you care about what's going on in her life? At home, you know? Do you care about her kiddos? Let's like, let's push her into the spotlight. And I think she's supposed to be in the spotlight, but everything's tiny. And heaven, what is the Father's will? We all have good intentions. You know, you can think of different ones that carry quite the anointing. I've watched the church do this to anointed ministers. When their lives are falling apart, pick yourself up by your bootstraps and minister. You're anointed. We need you. Come out of hiding. What you carry, the world needs. Jesus said, nah, I'm doing my Father's will. So I love that about Jesus. And it's a really important thing that he's teaching us here. He's saying, some people are going to want to use you for your, your, their own personal gain. And we need to have two things. We need to have discernment for those in our camp who would be trying to push us forward out of the timing and the will of the Father. And two, we need to know the timing and season of the Lord that we're in. Because he might be developing something inside of us and keeping something for a special appointed time. And when it's your time to be seen, you will. Especially if you're walking in obedience to the Father. You can't miss your moment. Do you hear that? You can't miss your moment if you're walking in obedience to the Father. That's good. And Jesus' brothers were right on. He could have gone to a bigger cedar, city, and he could have blown the town up with his amazing anointing. He could have done incredible things. And he, of course, right? It's Jesus. But the Lord actually led him to go the backwoods way. Probably even a longer walk. Don't despise it when the Lord asks, asks you to take the back road. Okay, let's read verses 12 through 39. So a controversy was brewing among the people, and with so many differing opinions about Jesus, some were saying, he's a good man. Well, others weren't convinced and insisted, he's just a demagogue, which basically means he's a heretic. He's... He's speaking things that he doesn't know about. But no one was bold enough to speak out publicly on Jesus' behalf for fear of the Jewish leaders. And so it was not until the feast was about half over that Jesus finally did appear in the temple courts and began to teach. And the Jewish leaders were even astonished by what he taught and said, how did this man acquire such knowledge? He wasn't trained in our schools. Who taught him? And Jesus offended them again. And responded, I don't teach my own ideas, but the truth revealed to me by the one who sent me. If you want to test my teachings and discover where I receive them, first, be passionate to do God's will. And then you will be able to discern if my teachings are from the heart of God or from my own opinions. Charlatans praise themselves and seek honor from men. But my father sent me to speak truth on his behalf, and I have no false motive because I seek only the glory of God. That's a big truth bomb right there. Again, he's declaring his mission to do the will of the Father, to bring glory to the Father. Moses has given you the law, but not one of you has been faithful to keep it. So if all of you are all lawbreakers, then why would you seek to kill me? He's basically calling them hypocrites. And they were and they knew that they were. But they like to justify themselves by the law. Have you ever noticed, 
Oftentimes, the biggest complainers about certain things are the people that are actually doing that thing themselves. <clears throat> Have you ever seen that? When we fall into judgment, we often are, it's often because we're doing it. And Jesus calls him out and he's like, if you guys were perfect, if, if you were following the law that you're trying to hold against me, you could have room to talk. But you can't even do that. Way to go, Jesus. I love, I love his boldness. And then some of the crowd shouted, you must be out of your mind. Who's trying to kill you? Jesus replied, I only had to do one miracle, and all of you marvel. Yet isn't it true that Moses and your forefathers ordered you to circumcise your sons, even if the eighth day fell on the Sabbath? So if you cut away a part of a man on the Sabbath, and that doesn't break the Jewish law, then why would you be indignant with me for making a man completely healed on the Sabbath? Stop judging based on the superficial. First, you must embrace the standards of mercy and truth. That's so true, isn't it? In fact, if you have the newsletter for this month, there's a similar story um, that I'm addressing in it. Jesus constantly is saying, hey, you're missing the point of the law. You're missing the point of, of the structure that we established for you. You're holding that at a higher level than relationship. You're holding that at a higher level than even what you know to be true about my character, God's character, what you know to be true in the scriptures about God. And now you're using these laws that he gave you to protect you and to create safety for you. You're using them against his nature. And now you want to come at me because I've healed a man on the Sabbath. But you do all sorts of things on the Sabbath that are the same thing. It's just, the, it's just legalism according to your own design. Jesus isn't putting up with it. And he's saying, first you have to embrace the standards of mercy and truth. Because mercy triumphs over judgment. And the law requires judgment. But God's standard is mercy. And Jesus is coming in and he's saying something new. Because they've been, they've been abiding by the law. And Jesus is coming in and saying like, hey, I'm here to release mercy. I'm here to give you a new standard. I'm here to release a new way of living. Mercy. Relationship. It's pretty powerful. So then some residents of Jerusalem spoke up and said, isn't this the one that they're trying to kill? A minute ago they were like, what's wrong with you? You're insane. No one's trying to kill you. And now they're like, yeah, we were trying to kill you. Confused little group. So why is he here speaking publicly and not one of the Jewish leaders is doing anything about it? Are they starting to think that he is the anointed one? But how could he be? Because we know this man is from Galilee. But no one will know where the true Messiah comes from. He'll just appear out of nowhere. So here they are. They're using all this law and scripture and Jewish history. And they actually don't even know it right. Because if they did, they would know that he doesn't just appear out of nowhere. There's prophetic foretelling in Micah. It talks about where he's coming from. And he's not from Galilee. They don't know Jesus, truly. They're just using fake news. They're, they're getting in the mob mentality and they're, they're going with what they're hearing. Jesus isn't from, he was not born of Galilee. That's not actually true to his story. But they're, they're starting the argument against him. Knowing all of this, Jesus one day preached boldly in the temple courts. So he knows they're starting to make these arguments against him. And he avoided the crowd before. He went the way of the Father in hiddenness. And now, it says, knowing all of these things, he's in Jerusalem now, he boldly preached in the temple courts. So now he's stepping into the timing of heaven. 
So, you think you know me and where I come from? I think picture Jesus going, you think you know me? You know where I come from? Don't you kind of see that? Are you stepping? No, he doesn't say that. But you don't know the one who sent me. Now he's saying to them, he's poking them in their little religious hearts. You don't know the one that sent me. He starts declaring who he is in veiled language. The Father, who is always faithful, that's the one who sent me. I've not come simply on my own initiative. The Father has sent me here, and I know all about him, for I have come from his presence. And this really took them off. His words caused many to want to arrest him. Can you imagine wanting to arrest him? But if your culture is the law, Jesus really, really offends that. His words made many want to cause to arrest him, but no man was able to lay a hand on him, for it wasn't his appointed time. This is the protection of the timing of the Lord. So you're going to see this all through it. The Father protected Jesus by sending him the back road away. Now he's in the thick of things. His obedience kept him protected in the midst of the mob. Where did he go? How, how come they couldn't get to him? There's a lot of people that, you know, think Jesus was really slick at getting through the crowd. And there's many people who believe he just supernaturally disappeared. I like that version. I like my Jesus to disappear in and out of the crowd. I'm just kidding. That's a joke. And no one watches Talladega Nights, so nobody knows the joke about I like my Jesus like this, but me and my dad. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. So, he disappears. And he's... Um, I lost my spot. I'm in 31? Okay, thank you. And there were many people who thought he might be the Messiah. And they said, after all, when the Anointed One appears, could he possibly do more signs and wonders than this man has done? So they're starting to see there's nobody like Jesus. He's just doing miracles left and right. So when the Pharisees heard these rumors circulating about Jesus, they went to the leading priests and the temple guards to arrest him. So the plot is thickening, right? And Jesus said he's, he's feeling, he's feeling the, the plot against him begin to happen. And he's recognizing the timing of heaven. My days with you are numbered. He says, and then I will return to the one who sent me, and you will search for me and not be able to find me, for where I am, you cannot come. When the Jewish leaders heard this, they discussed amongst themselves, where could he possibly go that we won't be able to find him? Is he going to minister in a different land where our people live scattered among the nations? They're thinking like Samaria or Assyria, something like that. Um... Is he going to teach those who are not Jews? What did he really mean by this statement? He'll search for me and you won't be able to find me. And where I am, you can't come. It's pretty interesting. There's just so much controversy about Jesus in this. And I look at this and I, again, I see the timing of Jesus understanding the timing of heaven over his life. But I also see that there's so many people, and I feel like this relates to today, there's so many people that have opinions about Jesus, that don't actually know who he is, that don't actually know his story, and they try to use the scriptures against him. Academia today is like, their favorite thing to do is to use the Bible against the gospel. And it is used out of context, and it's used... Um, it's just a, a lame argument that doesn't stand. And part of that is that you have to know Jesus to understand the scriptures. You have to, Nicodemus knew all about God. Remember we learned about that in chapter 3? Nicodemus was a religious scholar, well-trained, knew every word in the Torah backward and forward. 
But his eyes hadn't been opened to see the, the kingdom of God yet. His perception was really limited. We, Angela shared this a few months ago. We need God to understand God. We need God to love God. We need God in the midst of our own personal relationship with God. We can't even do it without him. And if we try, we end up with arguments and stories that aren't his story. And there's so much of this happening today in our culture. Um, you just have to look on Facebook for a tiny second to see, you know, there's countless people that are saying, this is who Jesus is, and I don't want any part of it. And don't you just want to comment back, that couldn't be further from the truth. You, how could you say that about him? You must not know him. But you, you can't say that. But it's the truth, isn't it? So what do you say in a situation like that? You do have the revelation. If, you, if you've given your life to Jesus, your eyes are open to see the kingdom. I think it's super important that we know this book backwards and forwards. There's a lot of reasons why. But when the religious system of Jesus' day tried to use the book that God had given to them to know God, they tried to use it against him. He understood the scriptures well. And he was able to speak to them in that language the truth and the reality of who he was. I hope I'm, what I'm saying is making sense. Yes. We need to know the word. We need to know the written word. We need to know the living word. And we need to know the the rainbow word, the, the, the one that comes from heaven to us out of relationship with God. We need to know Jesus' story frontwards and backwards so that we can stand when culture tries to, to say, this is who he is, and it's a lie. Every single one of us should know exactly who Jesus is. It's part of being a Christian is to reveal Christ. We're followers of Christ. Our lives should show the way to Christ, but we should know his story. We should know our story. Because, you know, like I mentioned to Nicodemus, the woman at the well, we talked about this a few weeks ago at Easter. When they accepted Jesus, when their eyes were open to see, his story merged with theirs. He changed their story. He did that for us. We need to know his story. So, then Jesus says this, and Dad referenced this this morning. He's, in, he's at the feast. On the most important day of the feast, the last day, Jesus stood and shouted out to the crowds. That's what I felt like this morning. I was like, when we're talking about being on the front porch, but we're inside, like the, the doors are closed, I was just like, Let's go out there. So I just went out there and just began to say, come, turn around, come home. Jesus did this. He began to declare who he is through this language. All you thirsty ones, come to me. Come to me and drink. And get this, this is, I love this. Believe in me so that rivers of living water will burst out from within you, flowing from your inmost being, just like the scripture says. He begins to call them back to the scriptures. Just like I said, we need to know his story. And Jesus proclaims, this is who I am. Come to me. You have all these arguments about me. You think you know me. Here I am. I'm the living water that will burst forth, forth from your life. All you have to do is believe in me. And Jesus was prophesying to them about the Holy Spirit that believers were being prepared to receive. The Holy Spirit had not yet been poured out upon them because Jesus had not yet been unveiled in his full splendor. You know, this, um, this statement that he is saying, all you thirsty ones, come to me. Come and drink. Believe in me so that liver, livers, 
So that liver's a whipping what up. You understand what I'm saying, right? Wimbos. That's like Princess Bride, yeah. Mountain. Wa-tru-wa. We was a whipping water with woe from your belly. It's like Ezekiel 47, where the rivers of living water flow from the throne and out of the throne and out all over the people. And there's, I love Ezekiel 47. He's talking about, the, he's flowing out of the temple. Who's the temple? We are. Jesus is referencing that. I'm going to fill you and I'm going to flow out of you. I want that today. So if you're thirsty, come to Jesus. All you have to do is believe. There's actually so much in this, and I, we just don't have time to unpack it. I hope that you guys will dig into the scripture yourselves this week and see all that there is in there. Because we have to just race through to get through it. But Jesus is saying um, that he's going to do these things. He's referencing the Holy Spirit that they're about to receive. Because Jesus had not yet been unveiled in his full splendor. And the splendor includes the splendor of the cross. This full splendor includes the splendor of his resurrection. And includes the glory of his ascension into heaven. And just as water poured out of the rock that was struck by Moses, so from the wounded side of Jesus, living water poured out to heal, save, and bring life to everyone who believes. The Holy Spirit poured out of Christ and into the church at Pentecost. That's us. We have that living water flowing through us. So, let's get back in. Verse 40. When the crowd heard Jesus' words, some said, This man really is a prophet. And others said, He's the Messiah. But others said, How can he be the anointed one since he's from Galilee? Don't the scriptures say that he will be one of David's descendants and be born in Bethlehem, the city of David. Again, they didn't know his story. They're making these assumptions about Jesus. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in the city of David, from David's lineage. David's his great, great, or however many great grandfathers. The very things that they say, he couldn't be that because of this, are exactly all of the reasons why he is who he is. So the crowd was divided over Jesus, and some wanted him arrested, but no one dared to lay a hand on him. Yeah, it is smart. But also no one's really speaking up on his behalf, remember that? When the temple guards returned to the Pharisees and the leading priests without Jesus, they were questioned, where is he? Why didn't you bring the man back with you? And they answered, you don't understand. He's speaking amazing things like no one's ever spoken before. They're like, we are not touching this. You're on your own. The people that they commissioned put a hit out on them. They're like, we actually see he's pretty special. We're not going to go there. And they answered, you don't understand, oh no, I'm sorry. And the religious leaders mocked, oh, so now you've been led astray by him? Do you even see one of us, your leaders, following him? This ignorant ramble swarms around him because none of them know anything about the law. They're all cursed. Just like us, a bunch of dumb, blinded Christians, ignorant Christians, you know, we're following Jesus. Blind faith. That's the stuff that I hear about Christians. Um, in fact, this week I read the words, uh, something along the lines of, I pity them because of their judgment-filled eyes. Wow, that didn't sound judgmental at all. <laughs> it's, it's crazy 
the arguments that people use, right? So it's okay if people say that you're dumb for following Jesus. That's the tact of the enemy. It's okay if people want to take a blow at your intelligence. The facts are the facts. And there's this whole thing happening right now. There's, I'm not going to get into political stuff, but there's all kinds of craziness on the news right now. Crazy arguments from people who don't know what they're talking about. Calling the rest of the world ignorant idiots. And wanting to bring all of humanity into the same crazy thought processes, right? We just need to stick to the story. Don't worry about what the naysayers say. Jesus didn't even, he just responded with more truth. But it wasn't like, let's get into a debate now. It was like, I'm going to just jump to what I want to talk about. I'm going to talk about me. I come from the Father. He's wonderful. I'm here to glorify him. Like, that's the kind of stuff. I, you know, if you want to, if you want to have your mind changed, just believe in me. And you're going to have life and living water flowing from you. If you want to call my friend stupid, that's fine. Just believe in me. It's okay. I don't care about that. Like, we need to take some cues from Jesus. We love to get in Facebook arguments. I got in one yesterday. I felt like someone was, you know, being really disrespectful. Not about a political thing, but about people who are on their face before the Lord. And I decided to publicly respond. It didn't go well. <laughs> yeah, Calvin's grounded. <laughs> Tyler, you're grounded too. No, I'm just kidding. He likes, he likes to debate on Facebook too. So does Dad. Not anymore. Joe Ray, not as much. I mean, right? It's just like starting to be like, eh. What if instead of doing that, because like I said, I did it yesterday, I succumbed to it. You know, when someone got a little testy about the Passion Translation, so did I. <laughs> yeah. It didn't help anything. It didn't change a flippin' thing. How about if I just tell his story? How about if we just tell his story? What if we just and we ignore the fake news? If we give it more attention, it keeps going. What if we just ignore all the naysayers and just proclaim like Jesus, okay, you think that about me? I will boldly preach in the temple square. I am the river of life. Come to me, all who are thirsty. He like didn't even acknowledge what they said. It's amazing. Jesus is so smart. So, here they are, calling people stupid. And just then, Nicodemus, sweet Nicodemus. Remember him? I like to call him Nick. Nicodemus, who secretly spent time with Jesus, spoke up. Because he was one of them. Sometimes, Jesus reveals himself and encounters people who even are trapped in darkness, who even are trapped in legalism, who even are trapped in academia, which there's nothing wrong with academia. So don't hear me say, don't go to college, because I think everyone should. If they want to go to college, go. Don't hear me say, education's not important. My mom would spank me. She was a teacher for like almost four decades. So I don't believe that. But even in the midst of all of that stuff, sometimes somebody from that culture will have an encounter with the living water. And they can speak to their own culture better than we ever could. Because we're not of that world. So Nicodemus speaks up, and he was a respected voice among them, and he cautioned them. 
Does our law decide a man's guilt before we first hear him and allow him to defend himself? And they argued, oh, so now you're not the kid for this Galilean. Search the scriptures, Nicodemus. You'll see that there's no mention of a prophet coming out of Galilee. And with that, their debate ended. And they each went on their own way. Wrong, religious scholars. There's actually quite a few mentions of prophets coming from Galilee. It said that, and it says that they apparently didn't know their own Jewish history. For the prophet Jonah, in 580 B.C., came from, I can't say it, gath Ephur, a village only three miles from Nazareth. It's believed that Elijah, Nahum, and Hosea also came from Galilee. And Jesus' Galilean ministry was prophesied in Isaiah 9, 1 through, 12, through 2. Again, they didn't even know their own story. But I love this. Because Nicodemus had enough. And there's going to come, I just believe this, there's going to come uh, an insurgence from the culture of today because it's, it's in this story. And Jesus is appearing to people all over the earth today. We heard about um, a place in the earth right now where people are seeking God. They're seeking the wrong God, but they're seeking after God with wholehearted intention to find him. They will find him. Nicodemus was a seeker. Nicodemus was hungry to know God, and he met him. And there's going to come an uprising from within the culture. There are many men and women in Washington, D.C., or even in our political system that have earned the voice in that system, and they're going to, there's going to be an uprising. Saints, we need to pray. We need to pray because it's promised. And Jesus' story confirms it. There's Nicodemuses all over the earth right now. And they're going to start to speak up. And they're going to diffuse even the argument of those that are supposedly the ones in the know. And that just ended the debate. Not Nicodemus' answer. But the truth was, how can you argue with lies? How can you argue with untruths? There's no point. The truth sets us free. Amen. So, in your sphere, where you are, where you have authority, where you spend your day beyond Sunday, Monday through Friday, used to be nine to five, that's not the hours people keep anymore. Whatever your hours are. Where you have influence, what do you do to be like Nicodemus? To speak out on behalf of Jesus. And what do you say on his behalf? Do you say anything other than his story? I think we just tell a story. Yeah. God said, you could say, are you thirsty? I'll give you living water. That's what we should say. Because the truth is, is the arguments are just going to end in a spiral of arguments. Jesus gave us the answer. Right in the middle, the whole chapter is controversy, controversy, controversy. Believe in me, and you'll have rivers of living water. Controversy some more. Controversy lies. I'm from my Father who sent me. I do my Father's will. That's the story. So, we need to know the story of Jesus from beginning to end. Manger to ascension. Creation to the fulfillment of all things. Because his story is in all of it. And I just want to say to you this morning, when we say yes to him, his story becomes our story too. And when we do see the prophetic truths and, what, and the intricacies of Jesus' life, we can only come to one conclusion. Jesus is the Messiah. He was who he said he was. And today when 
Everybody's trying to say who he is. Let's sing. There's no shadow you won't light up. This is who he is. There's no mountain you won't climb up. He's coming after us. He's a good father. His love is reckless. It's relentless. He's the father that stands on the porch and says, come home. This is who Jesus is. He's Savior, Redeemer. If your story is a mess, come to me, all of you who are weary, and I will give you rest. If you're thirsty, come and drink. That's who Jesus is. That's what we get to give to people. So, timing of the Lord. Living in the protection of heaven. Being okay with the season of hiddenness, if that's what he's calling you to. Knowing your time to be seen. Doing the will of the Father. And telling a story. That's what we're doing. And that's what he wanted to speak to us this morning. So, happy Mother's Day. Well, why don't you guys stand? I want to pray for us this morning before we are dismissed. Are you tired? Yeah. <laughs> Audrey, <laughs> Namir, let Papa pray for you. Are you thirsty this morning? Is anybody in here thirsty? Weary? Needed some refreshing. We had some pretty great refreshing during worship. But I just want to pray that Ezekiel 47 thing over you. I gotta find it, sorry. I'm gonna. So. I'm going to skip all the part with the measuring. But the truth is, is there's measured um, waters being released out over us. And there is a prophetic word that came out during the, uh, actually a couple of them, during the time of prayer and fasting, where people were actually seeing the water of Ezekiel 47 flowing through just this place for all of us. And it's, it's meant to be in all of us. And flowing from all of us. So, again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters. The water came up to my knees. He again measured 1,000 and brought me through. The water came up to my waist. Again, he measured 1,000. And it was a river that I could not cross, for the water was too deep. Water in which one must swim. A river that cannot be crossed. And then he says, Son of man, have you seen this? And he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. And it just keeps going, and the water flows, and the water flows, and the water flows. But I just want to just pray this living water that's meant to become a river that can't even be crossed by walking through it. It must be swam in it. We have to swim in this river. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would just release in and through us your river of living water today. God, we just declare we believe in you. We believe in your story. We believe that you are who you said that you are. You are the Christ. You are the son of the living God, and we just, we put our attention, our affection, and all of our hope in you this morning, God, and we say, let your living waters flow in and through us. We are thirsty this morning, God. We are thirsty for the living water of life to come and fill us, and Lord, we ask that it would go from the ankles to the knees to the waist to over our heads, God, where all we can do is just swim in your river and be one with you, Jesus. We want to get lost in who you are, God. We want to get lost from the noise of our culture, Lord, lost from the noise of um, just that spirit of this world that would come against just who you are. And we want to just get caught up in your river and swept up in your river, Lord. And it says that your river flows to every place. And that along the, the river, God, we want to be that river. We're trees of life that are for food and for healing for the nations. God, we want to be part of that. We want to see life begin to spring up from within this community of people. And so, God, I pray that as you send them out from this place, from this family gathering this morning, that as we go and do our Monday through Friday, God, Saturday too, this week, as we go beyond Sunday, that you would... Let the river of God flow from us. That it would affect every sphere that we're a part of, God. Whether it's in our work, 
in our families, in the grocery store, everywhere that we go. I just say, kingdom of God, flow through us. In the name of Jesus, be filled with living water and bring it everywhere that you go. In the name of Jesus, we just thank you for it, Jesus. Thank you for giving yourself to us. Thank you for pouring yourself out upon us and pouring yourself out through us. God, we want to know what you're doing right now in this day and how we get to be a part of it. So when we go from this place, Lord, open our eyes to see the kingdom like never before. Open our eyes to see the kingdom, that we can tell your story, we can proclaim the gospel. Jesus, we love you. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. I love you. Go celebrate your mom. Have a great day.